It's a pleasure to be here to, to take part on the TFF Jubilee, to talk to you out in the cyberspace, which I look upon through a small iPhone. It's a kind of technical miracle. And in the room here, in this room where I have, I have been so many times, uh, we are a group of kind people. It's also a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Søren Sumelius. I live in South Sweden, in the town of Helsingborg, and I work as a journalist of culture on a daily newspaper. I'm also a, an independent blogger. Uh, my, my blogger pseudonym is Nya Kultur Søren. It used to be Kultur Søren, but that is close, so now it's Nya Kultur Søren. <laughs> my last books, I'm also a writer, are a biography of the Chilean Nobel Prize winner Pablo Neruda, a book about the civil rights movements in uh, the United States called From King to Obama, and an interview book with a survivor from uh, Auschwitz and Ravensbrück. Earlier I wrote books about politics and culture in the Indian state of Kerala, and four books about conflicts and war in former Yugoslavia. I'm also a proud TFF associate since 1991. And listening to the speech before me, uh, Jan Elberg, uh, who was talking about Yugoslavia and the war and uh, the, 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 the missions we made there together in, in different groups, it, it, it uh, revoked, it woke so many memories from that time. And suddenly I saw a picture when we were interviewing Milo Giras uh, in 1992, which so it was such an extraordinary experience in my life, I will say. Well, it all started in September 1991, when I took part in the first TFF mission to, to uh, what was then still Yugoslavia. Uh, my first book uh, was called, the, in Swedish, The Last Journey to Yugoslavia. It was the first book actually published in, in uh, Swedish about what was happening in the Balkans. Oh, that journey from Sweden to, to, to the war areas in Yugoslavia at that time was the longest journey I've ever made from peace and normality here in Sweden to, to war areas. I will never forget it. I was born in Sweden during the, the Second World War, but living in Sweden made peace so evident, like the air you breathe, you never think of it. War was unimaginable. The task of the TFF mission to, in Yugoslavia was of huge interest to me, to try to understand what happened when conflicts turned to open war. The first journey was followed by several others during the war years to all parts of former Yugoslavia that was falling apart in, in horrible wars. I soon focused on three perspectives the role of the civil population in the wars, the role of outside actors as weapons, traders and military supporters. Sweden was one of those actors. Uh, Yugoslavia was number three in, uh, on the clients buying Swedish uh, weapons, as you probably know. So Sweden is really an, an, an important actor in the wars in Yugoslavia. People were killed by Swedish weapons. And the third perspective was uh, that which I'm here to talk about today, the role of the, the media. Being in, in war areas in the Balkans and studying the war reports in Western media, it was easy to agree with the Australian journalist Philip Knightley, who in his book The First Casualty made it clear that the first victim in war is truth. Is truth. It was also obvious that the warlords of the Yugoslavian, Yugoslavian republics used the media to demonize the others, to create a good we and a bad day. In that way, the events follow the first rule of propaganda, war propaganda, to make the other side so bad that it was motivated to use our good violence to destroy their bad violence. This demonizing process created an atmosphere that led to ethnic cleansing. The so-called others were made inhuman and treated inhuman. I wrote a book on the topic in Swedish, The Media War in Former Yugoslavia, 
based on interviews with media people, researchers, politicians and others. My conclusion was and is that words are more dangerous than bullets. This is not a phenomenon that appears only in the Balkans or in places like Rwanda. When the uh, US coalition of troops went to Iraq to overcome Saddam Hussein, most of the US media followed the ev events embedded with the soldiers. They made the war kind of cowboy fight between their own good soldiers and, ho and a horrible tyrannic dictator, the person of high evil. The US war was intended to destroy weapons of mass destructions and to create democracy, they said. When the statue of Saddam Hussein was knocked down by US Marine so soldiers, by the way, many in the West believed that it was the work of joyful Iraqis greeting the US soldiers as liberators. But of course, people in Iraq know better than that. There was uh, an, uh, a Gallup qu uh, questioning people in Iraq and only 1% of the Iraqis believe that the goal of the war was to, to create democracy. Half of the population knew very well that the American goal of the war was to control the oil fields of the land, of the country. And very few could, in 2003, guess that George W. Bush's war and demolition of the Iraqi state would create the basis for the IS and, as a consequence, the horrible refugee situation in 2015. If anyone should be put to the war, criminal tribunal, war crime tribunal in, in The Hague, that is George W. Bush. The most evil of the evil political leaders is, of course, Adolf Hitler. With new times follow new evil enemies in the West. The Serbian president Slobodan Milosevic play, played that role for some time. Al Qaeda's Osama bin Laden <coughs> did the same. The Iranian president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is forgotten by the most by most people today. Uh, now we have the Russian president Vladimir Putin, uh, and those mentioned are only a few in that gallery of evil men created by Western propaganda. Evil as, hit, evil as Hitler is repeated again and again to create the good we and the bad day and to make it possible for, for us, the good side, to use our, all our good violence to destroy their bad violence. In times of conflict and uh, war, media have a tendency to get patriotic and to accept the war decisions of their politicians with a few, with, with few questions. An obvious example of that was when NATO bombed Serbia and Kosovo in 1999, and Denmark was involved. According to an opinion poll at that time, during the war published in the British, uh, in the British magazine, uh, The Economist, the Danes were the people most favorable to war among among the populations in the countries taking part in the military actions. How could that be? The peaceful Danish people got more crazy. Are the Danes some kind of, uh, another kind of human beings? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I, I can hear from far away Johan Erba, who has a Danish background, but he is now Swedish. <laughs> no, sorry. We'll talk about that later. Uh, oh. But so, so strange it can be, and, and why is it so? Of course it depends on, on media and propaganda and what voices are heard in the, in the uh, discussions, in, in the official discussions, in, especially in big media, television and radio. So far I have mentioned things obvious to many of you, that media is part of modern warfare per, per definition. The question is, could it be otherwise? Back to Yugoslavia. During the 90s, VFF organized extremely interesting four days seminars with young journalists and politicians from Yugoslavia. Together with Jan Elvaya took part in two of these events. One was in Macedonia. Some 20 journalists met in a hotel of the old town of Ohrid. Uh, 
not far from the border between Macedonia and, and Albania. Uh, half of them were Macedonian Albanians, the other half Orthodox Macedonians. And it should be said that at that time, Macedonia was one of the few parts of Yugoslavia where they, have, didn't, where they didn't have any war. They had conflicts, but it never turned to war. And it still ha hasn't. Oh, the other seminar was held, held in Croatia, with Catholic, Croatians and Orthodox or Serbian Croatians coming together for four days, discussing the role of media, the, this, uh, the role of politics. In both, both of these cases, the participants were, in some aspects, antagonists who shared from in the beginning suspicions about the other part. What kind of people were they going to meet during these days? But slowly, in, during the discussions, their attitudes changed. We could talk about the role of media and how the ruling elites used media to demonize the others. In this kind of discussions, lots of topics popped out, like what, what could we do as a, as a journalist? What, what could we do not to make conflicts worse? How, how to avoid hate speech? How to avoid to demonize the others? How to avoid to create a good we and a bad day? If possible, could we write about suffering of the other side? In war propaganda, it's only uh, the suffering of, of the, the report uh, of the, my own side that is that is uh, observed. The, the others uh, don't suffer, or, or it's their own fault, or what you should say. And also the most difficult, maybe, to, to try to change perspective, to, to describe events as seen from the other side. If you could do that, you could learn that, that may, in very many situations there are big similarities. In theory, everything could sound easy, but in practice the idea is something else. During the wars, many critical Yugoslav journalists lost their jobs. They were kicked. I remember very, very strong, once uh, I was on a, followed a union meeting at the state television in Belgrade, the, the journalists were extremely upset. Their ID cards had suddenly been, been. Uh, they couldn't. They were, uh, not useful. They were turned turned off. They couldn't enter the TV house, which was the, the meaning, the, the the method which was used to, to to show that they were not uh, wanted there anymore. The Norwegian peace researcher John Galtum has created the term peace journalism. One main point in Galtum's way of thinking is that solutions implying violence are constantly overstressed and as a cons consequence non-violent alternatives are almost all the times ignored. Peace journalism aims to, at shedding light on structural and cultural causes of violence as they affect the, peop the lives of people in, in the conflict arena as a part of the explanation for violence. It aims at framing conflicts as consisting of many parties and pursuing many goals rather than a simple di dichotomy. An explicit aim of peace journalism is to promote peace in initiatives from whatever quarter and to allow the reader to distinguish between stated positions and real goals. To live in Sweden in 2015 is in many ways like living in a pre-war time. According to some media and politicians, again and again it's said that Russia is threatening Sweden and that the only solution to that threat is that Swede is, is a Swedish membership in NATO, which would mean that the country in wartime could be used as a base for nuclear weapons, among other things. In that discussion, which is so important for everyone living in this country, and which is 
and, and uh, not the membership is the break to a long tradition, which is some, for me, some kind of essence of the Swedish identity, the only solution to some kind of crisis with Russia is violence, which is NATO in this in this in this example. Uh, in this context, non-violent solutions like dialogue, like exchanges between the countries, are, are seldom or never mentioned, which is scaring me. A week ago, I returned home uh, after traveling two weeks in northwestern Russia up to the White Sea and Arkhangelsk. It started in, in uh, St. Petersburg, where I visited, of course, Dostoevsky's house. That's why I have this t-shirt with <laughs> Dostoevsky. Uh, and what I could see during these two short weeks is that there are so many bonds between Sweden and Russia. Of course, there is a conflict uh, which makes things complicated with the regime of today, but it's, it's also a complex conflict with, the, with, with everything, with the sanctions, with the uh, annexion of, of crime, etc. Et but, but there must be other solutions than, than making the Baltic Sea a NATO Sea and Swedish, uh, Sweden uh, a NATO member. In Russia, during this uh, journey, I met so many curious Russian, positive to Sweden, such as guides, uh, which have studied at the university to learn Swedish, to meet Swedish tourists. But where are the Swedish tourists today? They are not going east because they are afraid. And there is no reason to be afraid to travel in, in Russia. But what we could see now, I'm afraid, is that the new Iron Curtain is dividing Europe with Russia on the other side. A new destructive and, and uh, dangerous Cold War could be the result. Why has it turned this way? It's so crazy. Could it be changed? Of course it could be changed. Uh, I am one of the uh, participants in, in a book published by, by uh, Selander's publisher here in in Lund, called Ja uh, till Allianz Frihet, Nej till NATO, Yes to Non-Alliance, No to NATO. And uh, I think that book has been maybe some kind of start to a, a, a popular movement in the country. Uh, of course, I'm biased, but I meet almost every day people who are very involved in that kind of things. And I think that's a, that's a good beginning. Next week I'm going to a study circle. We will talk about the, in Swedish, Värdlands of Talet, this kind of, of uh, uh, deals with, with foreign countries using uh, a third of Sweden, uh, Norland, as a, as a uh, shooting, shooting fields, which is absurd. <coughs> the media in the West and in a country like Sweden go through an area of enormous change. Many newspapers suffer accelerating economic problems. Young readers want news for free. Advertisers are turning to internet campaigns. The digital versions of the newspapers have huge problems to earn money. The result is di diminishing editorial departments, fewer journalists, less critical reporting. To young Swedes, journalists is no longer a good work to, to, to look for. The process is like a prairie fire, extremely fast and totally devastating. The first victim of this media crisis is, of course, demo democracy. Without well-informed citizens, democracy is not possible. What will happen if the worst cases will turn to be reality? Will there be competent journalists who, in time of crisis, could explain and make people understand? Could news, new forms of information appear and turn up as a complement to the public service, radio and television companies, which still function quite well in Sweden? Maybe our social media are today playing an increasing role in the society, for good and bad. They create platforms for hate speech and prejudice but they also could be used to mobilize people in times of crisis in a way 
that could not have been predicted only a decade ago. Maybe that could also be a kind of peace journalism. At last, peace journalism is something with more distinctions than those I have mentioned here. In my opinion, it's extremely important to discuss peace journalism as a necessary alternative to the complete domination of war journalism in conflict reporting. Violence is a result of conflicts, but conflicts could never be understood through violence. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your presentation. I would welcome everyone here to ask both questions. Thank you, Dr. Gunnar. Sir, uh, Denmark is as democratic a country as countries can be. Um, still, they like to bomb whenever there's a chance and they support military activities and they even pull 30 billion Danish crowns to buy F-35 now. Absolutely useless. Is there anything in the Danish media that uh, can explain why the Danes have these, why they love war? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I've tried to, to uh, I follow the Danish media quite, quite uh, near. For many years I, I subscribed to Danish information, which is uh, extremely good uh, newspaper. We don't have that kind of newspaper in, in Sweden. And I read uh, the weekend Avisen as often as I can. And as I live in Helsingborg, I have the possibility to, to look on uh, Danish television, which often is better than Sweden. Denmark K for culture is better than Kunskapskanal, for instance. Danish DR2 is also better than Swedish television with, with competent discussions, taking up difficult subjects, giving them time, good documentaries and so on. How the newspapers, the big newspapers work, like Politiken and uh, Berlinske and, and uh, Aarhus Stift, Stiftsinnen, yeah. Posten, I mean, yes. I have no, I, I don't know really, but it, I, I can't, I, it must be something with the media, but I'm not, I'm not the person to, to give, an, give an answer to that question. Because in Sweden our media is not, is not uh, better in a very distinctive way. I mean the big Swedish newspapers don't have much discussions on, on the subject of Swedish NATO membership for instance. Uh, Television is, is better, I think, but, but they are also in, in the news program fragmentizing difficult subjects in a way that is, that is horrible. I think it has also to do with, you know, the coming together in the political spectrum. What we used to think was a social democratic party. That was for international solidarity, disarmament, to justice, equality, and all that. Has disappeared in both our countries. And the Social Democratic Party is not a movement for peace, which it once was, mm -hmm. and historically was. So it's it's a. I don't know how you see it as a media person, but I think it's also a kind of symbiosis between mainstream media and politicians. There is not a critical, you know, independent questioning of what is going on. There is. There's a what we call microphone holder attitude with many young people. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the politicians, uh, many politicians, both in Sweden and Denmark, very much act, uh, react to the opinion polls. And the, the mm -hmm. journalists, after discussions, they, they don't say uh, what, what was the most important in this discussion. No, they say who, who was winning this discussion. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that is nonsense, of course, but, but if in, in, I, I was especially in the Swedish election reporting, uh, looking upon that, who is, who is winning this discussion, which was repeated mm -hmm. again and again, in a way that is confusing, because the best argument is not always winning a discussion, but if, if it's only a question of win or, or lose, uh, the people who watch it don't understand anything. And they also have journalists who should interpret what was said, what did what did the, the prime minister mean with that, etc. And you might you might add to that the soundbite phenomenon. Mm -hmm. 
anything that takes more than 30 seconds to express mm -hmm. is something they think we are losing viewers or listeners mm -hmm. if we spend more on them than that. I mean, we're all here old enough to remember that at some point you could have an argument and back it up with some, you know, facts or something. But if, if things take more than literally 30 seconds, uh, people say this was not a good, good program. And they're very afraid of having a long argument, those who produce the programs. I'm not talking about people not wanting it, because I think it's possible to make people mm -hmm. listen to longer discussions if it's good. But the editors who do radio TV programs are afraid of having too long exposés about anything. Really? Yes. In the US we have Amy, Amy Goodman's television mm -hmm. channel, mm -hmm. which is the, the opposite. Exactly. Which yeah. gives you... And, and now in Russia, I, I watch the Russian television many times. And uh, of course it's a propaganda channel, but the, they also have time for long, long uh, conversations. I saw one conversation with... with uh, the new uh, Labour leader in, in, in uh, Great Britain, Kirby, for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And mm -hmm. it was a quiet conversation. It was up to me who saw it to, to think. I was not presented with, mm -hmm. with uh, slogans and uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we should have, uh, to create a better society, we should have better and better media. We should pressure on, uh, on public service media to not have programs like debate where everything is cut up in, in mm. 15 second statements and, and that makes it things horrible and confusing. Yeah. So um, I want to thank you. There were so many points in your talk that resonated with me and in the conversation after. Um, so I'm Swedish living in America for 15 or so years. Um, and from afar, I can really see this degradation of, you know, the Dagens Nyheter online. Mm -hmm. You know, now they report on the TV programs as if that's the news. Exactly. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm serious. I'm media reporting on, reporting on media. Yeah, media yeah. reporting on media. Mm -hmm. But I, um, here comes my question. I, I got quite immersed in the refugee um, wave in the last week. Really, yes. Yeah, and uh, touched by so much goodness that was just erupting all over in front of my eyes. But following that on social media more than old school media. Um, but then I started thinking today, you know, in America, the, the um, Occupy movement was really successful with the concept of 99% versus the 1%. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking, so, because I also, over the years, have seen that Sweden is like this uh, numbing of, of what's reported. And I feel like I hear so much about the Sverige Demokraterna, so much about the racism, so much about their leaders and what they say and didn't say, mm. what they meant and all of that. I, there's like nothing. And then the reports about the TV program. It's like, what's the rest? Where is the rest of the conversation? So then I thought, could we do, could we like drum up a movement of the 87% or something <laughs> like that? So yeah. I would love to hear what you think. No, I think that is necessary because the, the big media houses are, are putting two sides together and then, let, then they let them fight for one or two minutes and that's it. And it's confusing. It, it, it isn't giving new knowledge to a subject. Especially not if the Sverige Demokraterna is involved. So this, what what we see now happening with the refugees is, uh, and the move, the popular movement. Really, I was on a big demonstration in Helsingborg or with, yesterday with maybe a thousand people taking part. And uh, speakers were only people with refugee background mm -hmm. that told how they got here. And afterwards, everybody with flowers in the hand went down to the harbor put flowers for the people who died in, in, uh, over, in uh, traveling over the sea. So it was so, so moving and it was good for us to be there to see that, okay, we could go together and try to, to change things again. But it's a, it's a long journey to get the media on that, uh, on that train. Any more comments or questions to Sarah? I can say, uh, sorry, 
I'm yes. just going to say I'm Danish citizens, not all Danes, but like one. What's your name? I know one more. Uh, anyway, yeah, but you see, uh, when Denmark got into the Iraq war in 2003, mm. uh, after that, uh, there was uh, a few people who tried to, get, uh, to, to make a court case against the government because it was unconstitutional. Uh -huh. uh, as it was not approved by the UN or whatever. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, but after some time, uh, that court case was uh, dismissed. And the reason why was that uh, it, it didn't concern us. And I say, you know, as a taxpayer, as a, as a Danish citizen, you know, that's certainly my concern whether my country is going to war or not. Mm -hmm. But somehow mm -hmm. the courts mm -hmm. refused the, uh, the court case. So I don't know exactly what. So, so there are several, more than one thing uh, against bombs, but uh, still <laughs> main, mainstream, yeah. But uh, the view it is really a problem. Mainstream, mainstream Denmark is NATO oriented, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's very much militarized and everything. I, I, you know, I feel like a lot of things that before were in peace movement regime mm -hmm. now is military regime, mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, I saw there was a seemingly interesting uh, talk about Syria. So I was thinking of going, but when I could see it was at the military academy, mm -hmm. and I said, no way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, things have moved mm -hmm. somehow, but, and even things like human rights and things like that are militarized. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, um, I think, mainstream has changed a lot. Really, yes. Uh, this morning I, I joined a, a social group on Facebook. Let's restart the white buses. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah. suddenly thousands of people joined it, sending in money and uh, mm. to, to try to create safe journeys from yeah. the war areas. Yeah. I think before we end the discussions, I should like to just stress one point, mm -hmm. and that is the media situation in Sweden. It's changing so fast. Uh, the big newspapers are losing 20% advertising money every month oh, wow. compared with last year. Mm -hmm. Expressen the, uh, had more than 500,000 copies sold as it, when it was uh, mm -hmm. as most popular. Today it's less than 100,000. Uh, in Helsingborg you can't, cannot buy uh, copies of Dagens Nyheter anymore because they consider it too expensive to sell less number to sell uh, the single, single, copies. single copies yes and so on and and uh, uh, when Svenska Dagblad it was sold by Shipstead to Mitt Media it was one minute in in the Swedish uh, television report uh, it's uh, actual about it mm. which was a major media mm. story Absolutely. so the media landscape is changing so fast and, and I don't think politicians are aware of it. Uh, and I guess in one year or in three years we, we don't have many newspapers left and that means that we don't have competent journalists in places like Lund or, or Helsingborg, maybe in Stockholm a few, but... But, uh, but you don't mean to say, Soren, that because maybe the paper newspaper will disappear and read along the net instead that that should not be possible to have good journalism. No, but how you don't get money on the net. And the net news or well, thank you. Can take subscribe subscription after your first five articles yeah, you have to okay. pay or something like that. Today today it's not possible to create professional journalism, good uh, editorial or uh, internet uh, Papers, but let's hope that is possible in the future. Yeah. Things could change. I mean, it's it's. Uh... Maybe the only good media will have is TSF. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and maybe with Dogens, etc. A little bit. Yes, uh, I, I subscribe. Yes. It's, it's it's really a good. Yeah. What? They do, do very little international aspects. Oh. Yeah. That's good. But I guess one of the fascinating things is, and Gunnar is saying it with this uh, humorous comment, that you know there's not a monopoly for people anymore in the media to make media. No. We're doing a media thing today. You are now being listened to by hundreds of people around yeah. the world by means of an iPhone. 
People are now reporting when something happens somewhere way before CNN gets to the place on a plane with a crew of 40 people. <laughs> you know, somebody's there with a mobile phone and say, this is what happened. And I, to me, that's fascinating that the monopoly of the truth has disappeared long ago. Because when I grew up, my parents had one newspaper. That was the truth about the world. And there was, but that, they had, that had one advantage. If there was one national broadcasting system, that one national broadcast system would be forced to be broad and give uh, aspects from many points of view or perspectives because there was only one and if they were one-sided pro, let's say pro-NATO, somebody would uh, attack them and say, you should give it from all sides because you're the only one, you're the state monopoly on media. Hmm. And I think that is actually fascinating that either you have one big media that is forced to give us the news from many perspectives or you have thousands of them and we have to monitor them all and find out ourselves what we think the truth is based on many sources. This is fascinating, but it's also very dangerous in a way. Let's say that today we, what we are seeing is an embryo to a media class society. Yeah. There will be informed people, yeah. fewer and fewer, who are very well informed, mm. and lots of people who are not informed. It's a, it's a, or misinformed. a, a misinformed, a development like in the United States, mm. where many people didn't know where Iraq was geographically when the war started. Doesn't matter, the majority <laughs> knew it should be bombed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, 2002, in uh, January, I was in the U.S. Senate, spoke to an assistant to, Robert, to, to Senator Lugar, and uh, he talked about the imminent necessary attack on Iraq. I said, no, what about the Kurds? Do you have any plans for them? What did he say? <laughs> Kurds. You know, there are Kurds in Iraq and they want to form a different country. Uh, how, do you have any plans for what will be become them after you have taken over Iraq? He had never heard of Kurds. I remember Swedish parliamentarians who did not know that there were Serbs in Croatia. There was what we that there were Serbs living in Croatia okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when they decided to uh, split up Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well, knowledge is uh, kind of uh, not the most important thing anymore among politicians. Yeah, As I said yesterday, a lot of people had earlier a broad variety of advisors. A lot of money is now spent by governments and prime ministers on marketing companies, mm -hmm. selling messages mm -hmm. in a... In a advertisement way with short sentences and things. Really? Knowledge is, is less important than ever. Probably and I can see that. We have good source of information, and that is radio. Certainly, uh, the, yes. The, uh, <clears throat> the radio international correspondents are really high quality. And uh, some of the uh, uh, Studio F, for instance, in the case of good discussions. However, it is a problem because they have to be so impartial so we don't get sufficient discussion, but there's a lot of very good information, much better than I think in the, in the big newspapers. I actually want to, on that note, also say Swedish um, SVT documentaries. Yeah. When I come to Sweden, I watch documentaries online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are ex excellent talks on Monday evenings. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. They're mostly BBC. Huh? Yeah. 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 Okay. Friends, more views or comments? Otherwise, we will take a 20 minutes break mm -hmm. and then we will have a last lecture today on Burundi by an NGO person from Burundi, whose name we will not reveal yet, but you'll have to look us up at six o'clock. And we want to thank you very much, Soren, for your brilliant lecture on some of the most important things, namely how do we get the whole world reported to us when we cannot always go there ourselves and <laughs> see for ourselves. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody listening. Bye-bye.